geologist in the School of Earth Environmental Sciences. Uh, in my past life, I worked in uh, commodities trading in London, so I kind of retain a bit of an interest in metal supply as well as how, how they form. So we're going to cover some of those issues today. Uh, this is the Bingham Canyon mine in uh, Utah, which is the biggest open pit mine on the planet. Uh, we'll come back to you know, how much earth you need to move to get metals out of the ground in a bit. Uh, so I thought I'd start with a graph, because all geochemists start with a graph, but this is the, uh, the tin price on the London Metal Exchange from 1975 to this year, uh, adjusted by inflation. So on the y-axis is contracts of tin, US dollars per ton. On the x-axis is obviously year. And you can kind of see, like most commodities, it kind of fluctuates up and down, and then there's a bit of a rise in the 2000s, but then the last year or so, it's just gone through the roof. You know, I wonder what's happening there. So, uh, you know, in general, you can assign ups and downs in commodity prices to things that have happened. So, in the mid 80s and 1986, the International Tin Cou uh, Council collapsed. That was a cartel. Uh, so, that, that ended really um, an artificially high tin price. So, the tin price crashed um, quite considerably. And this really was the death knell for mining in Cornwall, for example. So, the last mine in Cornwall closed in 1998. That was South Crofty. And tin sort of spluttered along as an unloved metal for quite a while until uh, the early 2000s when it took off again. And what happened is that um, lead in solder was deemed to be toxic, so tin was developed as the substitute for lead in solder. So from the mid-2000s onwards, any electronics has got tin in it. Not a lot of tin supply because everyone had decided tin was yesterday's metal, so this, this started the rise in the tin price. The global financial crisis in 2008, there was a big crash again. The post-GFC commodities boom in about 2011, when everyone put their money in metals and rather than currencies. Then there was a bit of a dip in about 2014, and this was due to new supply from Myanmar, and I, I did some work in Myanmar at the time. But really, the story of the last uh, two years, or one year really, why now we're at sort of historically unbelievably high levels, uh, is really Tin's role in the era of net zero and in terms of new technologies. And Tin, is, as a metal, is not alone. And it's notable that South Crofty, which shut in 1998, is now being rehabilitated. They've just raised £40 million to spend two years pumping water out of the mine. Dewatering is the, is the phrase. So there's renewed investment either in, in re rehabilitating uh, mines in Cornwall. So the context for this, obviously, is the energy transition. I'm sure we're all aware of this. This is the decarbonisation of our economy, of our society. Uh, are really switching from you know, an energy infrastructure based upon hydrocarbons to one that fundamentally will be based upon metals or the requirement for a lot more raw materials. doesn't mean no role for oil in the future, but we're talking about approaching net zero. But this, this switch from, if you like, oil to, to metals is really a fundamental shift in the resource basis of our economy and of our society, and it has huge implications going forwards for our net zero pledges and what that means in terms of the supply of raw materials and and particularly metals, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about today, you know, the implications for metals, where, we, where they come from, or what are the issues in sourcing them. You know, the switch to renewable energy production means increasing demand for a huge range of metals. I've put a few here. You can go on the web, you can find periodic tables full of things that we need. Some of them are well-established metals, so copper and tin needed for wiring and power transformation. I'm a bit of a tin expert, so I always try and put tin in somewhere. Poor old love tin. But for example, if we switch to electric vehicles in this country, we need a whole new national grid. You need to build that, right? You have to transport that power. So you need iron, because that's steel, that's infrastructure. If you have a carbon capture project, or you want to build a nuclear power station, or you want to build a mine and get stuff out of it in a windmill, you need a lot of iron. Lithium, cobalt, they're flavour of the month at the moment because of their use in lithium-ion batteries. But there are issues with their supply we can talk about. Nickel is used. Molybdenum, manganese, aluminum, neodymium, other rare earths for storage, turbine gener um, power generation, <coughs> zinc, indium, tellurium for photovoltaics, and I could go on. But what it means is that there's a significant increase required in the exploration and production of a whole range of different commodities if we're going to move to renewable technology and renewable energy infrastructure. Um, you know, at the moment, these are the, the metals du jour. Everyone's talking about lithium. This is one estimate. There's wide and various range, ranging estimates as to how much metals will be required by 2050, for example, so-called net zero D-Day. But 
you know, one estimate by the World Bank is a 1,000% increase in lithium supply from 2017 production levels. Nearly 600% increase in cobalt supply. Massive amounts of copper, even though the percentage increase is not big, copper is a huge commodity. So there are some estimates that we will need to dig the same amount of copper out the ground as we have already dug out in human history, just to meet our requirements of raw materials. Nickel, so many of these, many of these um, uh, metals. And as I, as I said, tin, tin is it, right? So this is a, this is a study uh, commissioned by Rio Tinto, the, the mining major, in 2018, uh, by the MIT Business School, and they said, you know, in terms of new initiatives and new metals to invest in, what are the metals that will be most impacted by new technology looking forwards, uh, given current supply? And they said, well, you know, we think it's tin, because it is the, the metal that glues the tech revolution. You know, everything that needs solder has got tin in it. So not just for renewable power, but for robotics. You know, the fourth industrial revolution, advanced computation, um, artificial intelligence, you need tin, you need all these metals in various, you know, this is just one study. But I suppose what I'm demonstrating is that there is this sort of seemingly insatiable desire for a whole range of different metals, not just some of the ones that, that you think about. Um, all right, why do we want to mine? Can't we just recycle? You know, mining's a bit dirty. Uh, so policymakers love to have the infinite loop. This is, um, these are words from Karen Hangai. This is always her favorite point. But you know, the infinite loop, if you go and look up circular economy, you get this round thing that goes round and round. It's often green. And it says, you know, we recycle something, we make something from it, we use it, then we recycle it, and round we go. And this is ideal. You know, we don't need to dig anything out of the ground because we'll just reuse what we've already used. Um, big problems with this. Big problems with this. This is, you know, an aspiration, but it's just not going to happen at the moment. First of all, metal demand will continue to increase. So in the Western world, we use more metals and a wider variety of metals than we have ever used before. So the top left is global per capita metal use in the last 100 years. This is a log scale on the left. So, you know, we're talking about significant increases in demand for many of these metals that we use on a per capita basis because we all have computers stuck in our pockets these days. We all you know, have a lot more technology around us and our cities are being built up and used a lot more technology. So even if the world's population is static, we have this insatiable demand for more metals. But the world's population is not static, okay? It's predicted to grow over the next 50 or, 70, 50 or so years, depending upon your estimates. And this is accompanied by the rise of the middle classes, so people want to become more developed and technologically advanced. And so there will be this inevitable increase in demand as things stand for metals as the world population increases and everyone wants, wants to industrialize, to urbanize, and to have more technologies. And so, yeah, you know, various predictions. It's really hard to say where it's going to go, but everything seems to go up in terms of what metals do we need. So the metals that are currently in circulation is not sufficient. You know, we can't recycle everything because we need more stuff. We're using new and different metals. Uh, this is another great slide. This is sort of... Um, if you like, different types of power generation throughout the, the centuries and the kinds of metals that they use. So going from wind power, steam power, hydrocarbons through to photovoltaics, uh, a new kind, of, new kind of wind power, uh, catalytic converters. But the back story is that we are using a, a wider range of metals than we ever have before. So these metals are simply not in circulation to be recycled. You know, we... You can only recycle things that are available end of life if these things are not even introduced or are only introduced in small quantities because we've only started to use them. They're not available for recycling. Uh, some things are un or poorly recyclable. Again, this is sort of average recycling rates of metals. Uh, as things stand, many of them, red is bad, blue is pretty good, but recycling rates vary. You know, aluminium is pretty recyclable but other things, especially rare earths, are very unrecyclable. And there's an issue, again, with the iPhone, that once we make things, it's very difficult to unmix the metal. So the metaphor has always been, you know, getting the milk out of the coffee again. The way we manufacture things makes them very difficult to recycle, very energy intensive to get those metals out again. That's something we should look at going forwards, but at present, we can't recycle our way out of the problem because some, some things we just cannot recycle or the rates of recycling are very low. 
Um, and things are leaky. So, you know, every point of the process from exploration, through, well, mainly from mining through processing to manufacture to recycling, we lose metals. So it is not infinitely recyclable because nothing is 100%. Um, so we have a leaky system. So there is, you know, increasing demand for metals. There's a limited stock for recycling, especially for new metals. We lose metals during all of these different parts of the circle. Some metals are unrecoverable because we can't remove them out of what they've been made into. Many metals have low recycling rates. So this ultimately means we will need much more mining to meet our net zero obligations and to build out new technologies. There's kind of no getting around that. You know, we can talk about how we could, in the future, remove the need for mining, but that's not where we are at the moment. So this means more mineral exploration, more mine development, more ore processing and smelting. It means more transportation of metals. And all of this has major scientific, technological, economic, geopolitical, environmental, and societal implications. It's fascinating. And it's quite frightening as well. Okay. So, so that's message number one, more mining. All right, OK, what is a mineral deposit? So there's some geologists in the room, so I won't ask them to, to answer. But yeah, fundamentally, it's a... Uh, and I've just given this to our fifth year's similar lecture. You know, what is a mineral deposit? One, one um, definition is it's a depletable, naturally occurring source of commodities, which ideally you can kind of economically extract and make money from, which is why people are in the mining game, basically. Uh, but the important thing is that they are naturally occurring. They are formed through geological processes, often through orders of magnitude slower than, than we extract them. So, you know, average geological processes, 10 million years, 100 million years, we can exhaust the mine in 20 years. So, you know, we're kind of digging our way into a problem, but there is sufficient metals in the ground at the moment. There is not an issue with, you know, average amounts of metals. It, it's just we need to find where there are. Uh, but what happens is geological processes serve to enrich our metals of interest. So if you just dug out a piece of the continental crust... You know, the amount of tin and copper in that will generally be too low to be economically viable or to be locked away in, in something you, you can't extract it from. So we want processes that serve to take a large volume with low concentration of metals and turn that into a small volume with high concentration of metals. And that usually involves transportation of metals by fluids, hydrothermal fluids, or via magma, generally. Um, so we have some sort of concentration mechanism. Often it could be magmatism. Uh, but it serves to, in some metals, you know, go up by a thousand times concentration. And then you start to get an economic deposit. That's when you can start to dig things out. It's viable because you can actually extract the metals. So you need the earth to be friendly and to do these things for you. Uh, and that's what you're looking for, the end result of these processes. Um, I look at granite-hosted deposits in particular. This is just one class of, of, of deposits. But this is where you have the intrusion of a granite. And granite is a magma. Um, but as that intrudes, uh, the, these deposits are major sources of copper. They produce porphyry deposits, for example. Major sources of good old tin again, lithium and, and tungsten. Uh, but this is the end result of a number of geological processes. We, we melt something in the mid-crust. This creates a magma. That, that rises through the crust. It cools. It crystallizes. And then we often have what's called the exsolution of a hydrothermal fluid. These are wet melts. So you get a fluid, a water, that comes off of that that water contains the metals, and then that's what precipitates out ore minerals. So the processes of forming just these types of deposits are quite complicated. Not all granites are mineralized, so you know, we're always interested in what, what's the switch that turns on, you know, what is the special, the, the, is it the, sort of the Goldilocks point? Why, why do we, some of these form tin deposits or, or copper deposits, and why some don't? And when we can understand better these genetic models, then we know where to look, because ultimately, the driver for these types of, certainly granite magmatism, is large-scale geodynamics. You know, it's no coincidence that all the copper deposits are formed along Chile. You're above a, uh, a subduction zone. There's a lot of... You need the input of energy and heat, basically, to, to drive the geological processes that form these things. So we're looking at areas that are geologically active that then serve to, to form, in this, in this example, sort of granite magmatism, and then we can, we can start to understand how these deposits form. Um, what is mined? We don't dig copper out the ground, we dig copper ore. I'm sure most of you know this. You know, with the exception of precious metals, uh, most base metals are found as ore. They could be found as oxides, or they're typically found as sulfides. So this is chalcopyrite, this is 
the, the most common copper ore, uh, but we dig ore out of the ground that then has to be cracked and broken apart and we have to extract the copper from that. Uh, and typical grades are pretty low. So grades are, you know, what is the ratio of that ore to the other stuff we don't care about, we call gain. Uh, but, you know, typical copper grades contain copper 1 to 1.5%. So for every tonne of rock we extract, 99% of that is just waste. We just want the 1%. You know, some ore bodies are very well defined and we can follow that. Some are what we call disseminated, so it's a lot cruder. So you extract your rock. You know, this is, this is the Escondida, one of the biggest copper mines on the planet, which is, if I can make this work, here's the Sears Town and Petronas Town. So these are the size of some of these mine, these ore bodies. The Bingham Canyon I showed at the start is uh, four and a half kilometers wide and one and a half kilometers deep. That's a lot of digging. You know, people have dug out a lot of rock. And most of that rock then has to be crushed. You have to concentrate it, so you want to get your grade of copper from 1 to maybe 60, 70%, because then you need to ship that off somewhere. There's no point in shipping 1% off, it's inefficient. So you go through a process of concentration, which could require you know, various chemicals or gravity or electrolysis, depending on what you're interested in. And then you send that to a smelter, which could be 2,000 miles away, somewhere else, which will then smelt that and ultimately give you copper. So that's how you get copper. It's, a, it's quite a long-winded process, and it's an energy-intensive process. Okay. So mining is an exercise in earth moving and in minerals processing. And, and this, this figure here on the bottom right is you know, the point that you may know your extent of mineralization, but you'll only mine a proportion of that because that's only the economically valid part. You're only going to make money if you dig this stuff out. This is too low grade to actually make money. So you'll find your mineral deposit, but then you'll, you'll only focus on a small part of it. Okay, great. Yeah, we need some more metals. And we know that 0.02% of the Earth's surface is currently being mined. There's plenty of metals out there. What we need to do is find those other de deposits. You know, what's the problem? Easy, right? Well, unfortunately in life, there are always and inevitably problems. And I was very lucky. I went to COP26 last year, and I was there for two days, the energy day and the finance day, and it was full of various energy ministers of the world standing up and saying, you know, by 2035, and this was while the country was building coal-fired power stations, by 2035, we will switch to um, a renewable energy infrastructure, just like that, there we go. There was no appreciation. The only person that talked about mining was Kwasi Kwarteng when he talked about reskilling coal miners of the past for lithium miners of the future, which is its own issues. They don't necessarily live in the same place. But um, no one talked about the issue of raw material and the latency and the supply of raw materials to enable that. So this is a report from McKinsey, and other people have made this point. You know, in the aftermath of COP26, net zero commitments are outpacing the formation of supply chains, market mechanisms, financing models, and other solutions, and structures needed to smooth the world's decarbonisation pathways. We're making all these promises to meet the climate crisis that we're going to be net zero by 2050, we don't know if we can do it, right? We don't know if all the other things aside, the issue of raw materials will be on the table to allow us to, to, to make that happen. So there are problems with mining and metal supply and the latency of metal supply in where they come from and in the impact of their extraction. Ah, so challenges in mining and metal supply. Number one, slide of many. So mines have a long development time. I believe the average time from greenfields, boots on the ground, excuse me, usually the geologist that's first on the ground, to actually production is 22 years. So, you want some lithium? I'll see you in 2044. That means you've got six years, right? Okay, so it is true that certainly green fields where you haven't explored before, it takes a long time from early exploration through advanced exploration, drilling, feasibility studies, raising money, you know, ticking all the other things you need to tick, building the mine before you can ever actually get metals out the ground, you know, at least 10 to 15 years. Obviously, you can go to existing mines and rehabilitate them, as they're trying to do in Cornwall. That short circuits all of these things. But the idea that you can just go out, find new lithium, and dig it out the ground is it's going to take you a while, okay? So, you know, first of all, the latency of supply, the things we've never explored in sufficient or, you know, in, in, as, as in sufficient quantities for in the past, we're kind of starting all over again. Uh, average mining grades are decreasing. So this shows you average grades of copper that are being worked over the last 100 years in a projection into the future. So I said, you know, we're about 
1.5%, grade of copper. It used to be a lot higher. The projected grades are decreasing. The mines that we're finding, the mineral deposits we're finding, are getting smaller. So in general, we're finding smaller mineral deposits with lower grades. So mining is becoming less efficient. It's getting harder to get metals out the ground. Um, and exploration success rates are falling as well. A lot more projects are failing because we're not finding the min mineral deposits. We kind of know they're probably out there, but we're not getting good at finding high grades. So, you know, that means it, takes it costs increasingly more to get copper out of the ground than it needs to. Ah, another problem. So, in 1850, Europe was the biggest mining jurisdiction on the planet. We did more than 60, 70% of mining operations was in Europe. Now it's about 2-3%. We've outsourced mining essentially to the developed world or, or developing world, the global south. You know, the UK now imports 40 million tons of metals a year. Um, and I think we've lost that connection between what we use the, and, and the fundamental source of raw materials. Because everything starts for the rock, again, in the words of some, some famous scientists. And so every supply chain starts with a mine. If you control the supply of raw materials, then you can control the rest of the supply chain. And so we have outsourced our control of raw materials to other countries, which could be good or bad for those countries, but it becomes a problem if things change. And this doesn't reflect the fact there is no mining potential in Europe. It reflects the fact that we have chosen not to do it in Europe. People don't want to mine in their back garden. You know, I have various anecdotes of meeting people on planes or wherever, and, and they're there with their iPad, and you're like, oh, we should get rid of, rid, rid of all mine. And you think you're in an aeroplane, you have an iPad... You know, you've lost that, you just lost that mental link. So I think, we, you know, a lot of education about the fact that mining is important and, and we, can, we, can, we can bring it closer. And this feeds into the issue of strategic metals versus critical metals. This is kind of the title of my, uh, my talk. So this is a plot of rare earth element supply up to, I don't know, a couple of years ago. But, you know, for most commodities, you get a similar kind of graph. So in the rare earths, uh, the US is the biggest supplier in the 70s and 80s, but we have, basically China came on stream in the mid-80s and now absolutely dominates supply. Um, but this means that, you know, the supply of many of these raw materials is in the hands often of China, uh, and it can be used as a political tool. So that is a problem. If you're interested in the difference between critical and strategic metals, this is one definition. Strategic means you need it. So all of these metals are strategic. Critical means you don't have it or... It's a problem, okay, so that's one, one way of getting. But, you know, this, this is another issue. Global geopolitics, you know, we're shifting from Middle Eastern oil to maybe African and the global south metals. That has, you know, big implications for supply chains and resources. And I think especially during the pandemic, this issue of the fact that everything is made elsewhere um, com comes back to us. And, you know, if you can, if you can open up tin mine and lithium mine in Cornwall, then that makes things like a, a, a gigavolt battery factory in the UK much more viable, because then you can start to build the supply chain, then you can build an electric vehicle plant. So, so you know, localising mining is great for the, the carbon footprint of where that ore is shipped across to, and also, also good for local jobs and, and for, for securing supply chains. Ah, at some level, very small scale, this is a great, uh, a great image. So these are 2019 figures. This is Tons of metals dug out the ground in 2019. So, 94% by tonnage of all metals was iron ore. Isn't that phenomenal? You could kind of not get out of bed for anything less than iron ore, and, and you'd be made. So this is iron ore, 3 billion tons of iron ore. Uh, something like copper, 20 million tons. So we're now looking at what we call the industrial metals, so copper, uh, Aluminium, for example, significantly smaller, but still, you know, big markets in their own right. And the value of copper is more than the value of iron, so the financial value of these, these could be more comparable, for example. Uh, but, you know, poor old tin is here, 300,000. Uh, lithium is here, 90,000. You know, so these are much, these sort of tech, tech metals or green metals are much smaller in terms of volume and tonnage. And the markets are much more immature and supply is much more sort of concentrated in a few mines. So, you know, when you're talking about supply shocks, if you have a much larger, well-developed, mature metal, it's much more resilient to some of these really essential new metals that are coming on board. 
Um, so like, for example, copper, I said we need a load of copper, but this is where, you know, copper are known reserves in 2019, just known reserves, and that's not all the copper, that's what we define as a reserve, which is a subset. But, you know, we can get it from Peru and Chile and Mexico and the US, Australia, DRC, we used to get it from Russia, maybe not now. You know, variously. So if there's a coup in Santiago, Chile shuts down. Okay, it's a bit of a problem, but it's not going to be a massive problem because other mines will just upscale their production. Actually, it might be a massive problem for copper, but okay, that's that example. But you know, depending on where your, your, your metals come from, you can just shift production somewhere else and then you can pick up the supply and it's not a problem. And copper is fairly well established. We've been exploring and producing it for many decades and we kind of know where the supply can come from in the future. And, you know, if you've got four copper mines along a geological feature, then you probably know there's a fifth mine there, so it's easier to explore for these things. So copper is a strategic metal, but we're not too worried about it. We know we just need to dig more of it out. Uh, lithium is a bit different. So lithium is a metal of, of the, the month for the year. Okay, uh, again, another McKinsey report. So, you know, in 2010, battery demand was only a small proportion of the total lithium demand predicted to absolutely dominate it. So just like tin in 2000s, lithium in the 2020s, you've got a sudden new um, demand of lithium from somewhere new, and you don't have the mining infrastructure and supply chain set up to produce it. Uh, to the point that lithium prices have risen so much that now 70 to 80 percent of the battery cost of lithium ion batteries are the raw materials, up from 20 to 30 percent because of the, the supply restriction of lithium and cobalt. So it's a minor metal, it's not even traded on the LME. It's traded uh, as sort of over-the-counter contracts. Uh, and we mainly produce them either from hard rocks or granite sources, pegmatites we call them, which tend to be really small deposits, maybe 400 metres big, um, or brine. So this is a picture of uh, a brine, they're called salars in the Atacama Desert, where lithium groundwater is pumped up. Uh, it's evaporated, and then we scrape off lithium salts. Um, so... We get them from brines, which are the cellars, which have their own environmental issues, or we get them from pegmatites, which, is, which are hard rock um, sources, so primary sources of lithium, which have often been historically mined for tin or cesium. So lithium has traditionally been a byproduct, and people are going back to these old mines to, to re-explore them. And I, I suppose the story of the last few years is that, again, the top, without bombarding you with information, this is year across the bottom, Lithium price in the black line, you can see this only goes up to 2018. But in terms of supply, uh, red is the brine and blue is the hard rock. So really over the last two or three years, the jump in lithium supply is coming from hard rock uh, pegmatites rather than brines. And that's in part due to the type of lithium that's produced from that, which is more conducive to battery technology. So it is the rise of the pegmatites, largely from Western Australia, mostly from Greenbush's mine in Western Australia. But it means that if... Western Australia was hit by a meteorite, or had an earthquake, which it hasn't had one for a billion years, probably. But, um, and suddenly green botches was knocked out. You know, that's half your lithium supply has disappeared overnight. So it's much more susceptible to supply shocks and price shocks because it's such an immature metal. So, you know, it may be that we decide we all want lithium ion batteries and lithium cars, but supply will never be sufficient to actually do that, and we need different metals and different technologies. So this is the current state of affairs, but it could be in five years' time we look back and say, you know, lithium, we just, we could never get the supply in time, we've, we've got hydrogen cars or something else. So it may be that some of these metals become so difficult to source that we have to look for um, uh, uh, other metals for substitution. Uh, there are problems with mining, more problems, uh, more problems with mining lithium pegmatites. Uh, as I said, the market's very small, the deposits are incredibly small, so there may only be five or ten years mine life in a pegmatite deposit compared to a big copper deposit. So you can put all your infrastructure in, get money out of it for five years, and then that's it, you've got to close it down. So the economies of scale are really difficult with lithium uh, projects. They are difficult to mine, they're structurally complex in terms of their geology, they tend to be zoned, so this again is a cross-section of the um, Greenbush's pegmatite, this is a geological cross-section, so this is the surface, this is depth, 200 kilometres, 200 kilometres, the actual pegmatite is really here, so a lot of this is um, 
stuff you don't want. So in terms of trying to mine it from a mine engineering perspective, it's quite hard. We find lithium as spodumene, which is uh, a lithium element in silica um, or mineral. That's quite difficult to process and quite energy intensive to process to get the lithium out of it. There are what we call deleterious elements, so things like phosphorus and fluorine that accompany those ore minerals, which the smelters don't like. So it's difficult to smelt as well. It's hard to concentrate. You know, when I talked about copper, you get from 1 to sort of 70% and then you can transport your concentrate. Often with lithium concentrate, you can only get to 6%. So the transportation cost of lithium concentrate is really high. So that's a problem. And other lithium minerals, such as lipidolite and thimaldite, we don't really understand how to process them yet, because, again, it's a new metal. So you could find a lithium deposit, but it's really hard to extract lithium from, from it. Uh, sorry, more bad news. <laughs> Mining is energy and water intensive. So, you know, by some estimates, 5% of all ele electricity ever produced has been used for crushing rocks. Uh, total mining, including steel making, is 10% CO2 emissions. If you got rid of coal fired steel making, that would come down to 2%, which is half of Russia, I think, in terms of CO2 emissions. It uses quite a lot of water in terms of its concentrating operations, so if you have it somewhere in a drought area, it's not great. And obviously, I'm not even covering the issues of mine closure, remediation and all the other issues around it but you know people often only hear about mines in the news when a tailing dam bursts or someone blows up aboriginal artifacts or stuff like that so things do happen accidents happen there are problems with closing mines as well uh, so we talk about sustainable mining i'm not going to dwell too much upon this but you know in summary we know we need more metals we know that means more mining and we know that there is this is urgent. We have made net zero commitments to 2050. If we want to meet our Paris agreements, then we need to suddenly get a load more metals and start building that stuff out. But there are challenges in mineral exploration and in production. So what we find, the quality is deteriorating. Uh, the footprint of mining itself is significant in terms of CO2, energy, water. This societal and cultural cost that I know people in this room work on as well. But there are sufficient metals in the ground, so there's no geological limitation on where those are. We just need to find them. Um, but supply is limited by the lead times, by the failure often to get a social license to actually mine, which is becoming increasingly important. Either. But, you know, ultimately, it's by the price we are prepared to pay in terms of the environmental societal and the financial impact of mining. And that is a, a decision for us as a society, whether that's something we want to do. You know, ultimately, if you have 7 billion people on the planet, they use things, and you've got to extract that from the ground. That's going to have an impact. And, and the choice is, you know, what that impact is and where that is. Uh, so there are good news. <laughs> so, you know, what can we do? Some things we can do is we can, we can explore, you know, be smarter in our mineral exploration and find higher grade deposits richer deposits, perhaps more locally, and we have to do it more sustainably. That's in part a role for geologists. Um, we can significantly improve mining efficiency, so we can make it much less environmentally egregious to actually process, uh, a, a sort of energy intensive to process ore. That would have a massive impact. We could include recycling rates, so when we manufacture things, we can think about end of life more, which people are starting to do. We can look at substitution, so we can maybe, as I said, maybe lithium is not the metal, maybe it's going to be something else. The example of tin for lead, maybe there'll be another metal that is got better supply that we can use in batteries, for example, that gets us out of the problem. But, you know, none of these are easy. Uh, it's really topical. The UK government produced their critical mineral strategy over the summer, uh, which was the result of lobbying by uh, a number of people, including the Critical Minerals Association. So the issue of criticality of metal supplies is, certainly was <laughs> on the government uh, radar. Uh, we're having a, a roundtable in October. Let me know. It's a free webinar. You can, um, you can join where we've got some experts uh, who will talk about their experience of developing the strategy and what it means specifically for geoscience, but also UK mining more generally. That's a one-hour event in October. But it is... You know, it, it's interesting that it's finally on the radar of, of the UK government, and governments around the world are thinking about the US equally. The EU knows about the issue of this. So this idea of resiliency is coming in. 
You know, I'm going to big up the role of geoscience. As I said, I'm a, a geoscientist myself, so we have um, a stake in the game. You know, we do academic research here. Adrian does as well, you know, to fundamental or genesis, uh, to understand how, you know, the processes behind the formation of these deposits, then that can lead to better exploration tools. Obviously, we train exploration geologists. We have an MSc here in mineral resources, which, which talks about some of these issues, but also trains them about the challenges for exploration. And geologists are often the first on the ground. You know, if you want to do greenfields exploration to a new area, often the first people that are sent out will be the geologists, so the people who are first on the ground. Obviously, environmental geoscientists and earth scientists as well, in terms of the impact of mining, is really important. Um, gratuitous picture of a helicopter in Greenland. Uh, geoscience and the energy transition more widely, again, picking out the role of ge geoscientists, right? So I'm involved in um, the Geological Society's energy transition theme. There's a mugshot of me at COP, but, you know, whether you're talking about critical raw materials, whether you're talking about carbon capture technology, um, geothermal technology, so many of these, these sort of technologies which can mitigate climate change and can move us to a net zero world involve the subsurface, and that all involves geologists because we're kind of the experts in, in how all of that works. Uh, and my own research, as I said, is, you know, we have a mass spectrometer down in the Hurdy building. We look at uh, metal mobility in some of these granitic systems. We zap them with lasers. Um, we go around the world. I've done research in Myanmar. Um, here's some of our students looking at a big hole in the ground last year when they were visiting the Rio Tinto. So we train up geologists here for mineral exploration. We do sort of fundamental research into how some of these deposits form. So that's kind of my role. Anyway, thanks. All right. Great. Thank you.